welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome, everybody. So glad you could join me with this amazing, amazing interview. I am so excited about this book and this author. Uh, the book is Soul Medicine, Healing Through Dream Incubation, Visions, Oracles, and Pilgrimage. And the author is Dr. Edward Tick. And it's an important book for everybody. It's going to sound like it's heavy duty stuff, but it's not. And it's magical. And it's important that we get the information out there. The book is an in-depth look at ancient Greek practices for profound, lasting healing and healing the, and healing. The modern practice of medicine and psychology grew out of the ancient Greek healing tradition said to be founded by Aeschylus. I, I'm, I'm probably going to mispronounce a bunch of words and hopefully everybody will forgive me. He was the god of healing and dreams. For 2,000 years, the system spread all over the Mediterranean world and planted, its roots, uh, and planted the roots of Western medicine and psychology by offering ritual and holistic practices that recognize that healing begins at the soul level. Yet since that time, the spirituality-based practices were cast aside, leaving behind only the scientific medical techniques and dom that dominate the healthcare today. Resurrecting and restoring the sacred mythological and cultural origins of medicine and psychotherapy, he has explored the soul healing practices missing in our contemporary health systems. He looks at the dream incubation tr uh, tradition of Asclepius, hope I didn't mispronounce that, sacred theater of Dionysus and oracle gifting of Apollo, special practices of warriors and their roots in Neolithic shamanism and indigenous traditions, demonstrating the ritual use of dreams, visions, oracles, synchronicities, and pilgrimage for healing and connecting to the transpersonal and divine. He explains how dream incubation is a technique in which you plant a seed for a specific healing or growth goal. He explores how we can use ancient healing philosophies and practices to achieve holistic healing today. And he examines the interaction between mind and body, that's the psyche and the soma, and between physical illness and the soul to heal, PTSD and trauma. And he explains the art of making accurate and holistic interpretations of signs, symbols, and symptoms to determine what they reveal about the soul showing how dreams and other transpersonal experiences are essential components of soul medicine. He reveals how the restoration of the soul facilitates true healing. He is an internationally acclaimed transformational psychotherapist, international pilgrimage guide, educator, author, and in his spare time, a poet. So I'm so, so delighted to welcome him to the show. Welcome to the show, Ed. Thank you very much, Barbara. And Thank you for having me and for that very thorough and um, circumspect introduction. Well, I, I hope it doesn't scare anybody off because actually once I read the book, it all makes perfect sense. Um, and 
And I think the the main thing here is how um, we have separated the spirit from the physical in in today's society, and and where with with connecting to the spirit and bringing it up and and linking it with and working in Congress with the spiritual total healing can take place. And this, you know, our physical medicine can take care of mostly the symptoms, but it doesn't get to the root cause and your technique does. And I was so impressed with it. Um, it, It's, you know, there, I have tons of questions, especially about the first, the first one that I want to ask is, you know, you talk about big dreams you know, fast and, and wait for a big dream to come. What What is the description of a big dream? Okay, well, thanks for jumping right in, and that's a good place to start. Uh, everybody dreams, of course, and most people are fascinated and awake and uh, to curiosity about their dream life. So um, it's a good place to start. Now, and it also connects us, uh, the modern world, to the ancient world. So big dreams. What are big dreams? Well, Carl Jung introduced the term big dreams and little dreams. He actually uh, learned it from, uh, from a Native American community um, in northern Canada who they differentiated between big dreams and little dreams. And when Jung visited North America, he learned this from them. All right, so we all know that Carl Jung and Jungian psychology is heavily dependent on dreaming, and they do a lot of dream analysis. Uh, many, many people do know how deeply people think about their dreams or value them, but dreams are the language, and all images are the language of the soul. So our soul, our deep mind speaks to us through imagery and our soul communicates through imagery without necessarily telling us what it means. We're just getting the dreams, the story uh-huh. that we have. Heard. Or as you refer to the Oracle of Apollo in the ancient world, people went to or- Oracle sites to Delphi and others, and they got messages, but likewise, they had to interpret it. They didn't say exactly what they meant. So, there's always interpretation of the imagery that uh, we have to do, and that's our human task and challenge. Big dreams are differentiated from everyday ordinary dreams in major ways. Uh, Big dreams appear rarely. We feel spiritual presence in them. We are presented with uh, archetypal imagery. So gods and goddesses, um, nature spirits, uh, trees talking to us, magical appearances, uh, anything that we, that as individuals, we attribute to me- a large metaphorical uh, meaning and to divine sources. In Jungian psychology, people are going for Jungian analysis for weeks, months, years, and they're actually trying to to facilitate one or a few big dreams that will be so strong, so complex, that it literally, well, we use the phrase, change my mind. I changed my mind. Uh Literally, we have significant dreams or visionary or oracular experiences. They are changing our minds because they're changing the way our imagery functions, They're making us accessible to new imagery that's loaded with spiritual energy. Uh, And they're re-changing the way the archetypes um, are arranged in our psyches so that we actually become different people and we change and transform by the way our deep imagery changes. Most of our dreams are everyday dreams having to do with uh, our everyday life or our childhood or our psychological issues, and, of course, our neuroses, most of them. Uh But occasionally, big dreams come through that we know is so, so, so much more and is really somehow the divine speaking to us. So people usually know when they have a big dream, and they know that it is of a completely different class, and, um, as I say, and it changes our lives. I can share from the house that I had a big dream when I was four years old that set me on my life's path and 
I'm 73 now, so 69 years later, I vividly remember it. I'm still working with it and following it. It was that big and spiritual and life-shaping for me. Uh, when when I've had a big dream, the way I realize it's a big dream is that I remember it. It isn't the same fleeting type of dreams that I have at night or, or in a waking state. It's something that I can, t- and like you said, um, days, weeks, decades later, I can remember it. And mm-hmm. so... So, you know, it, it's for, for many people, when you say big dream, they go, so, so many people don't pay attention to their dreams, don't pay attention to the insights and inspirations that come through dreams. And I think your book is, is phenomenal in that it, it helps people to realize that, that we have so much more power within us to, to not only do, do healing, and, and sometimes, sometimes it can be done through dreams, and sometimes it can be done in Congress with uh, with physical stuff, and and that gives you a, a more of a total healing um, experience. Oh, oh yeah, and, and and I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. I'm interviewing you. Oh, oh okay. Well, we're both enthusiastic, and that's good. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, even the word enthusiasm comes from Greek, and theos. It means uh, God in us. When we are enthusiastic, we're feeling spiritual power and presence entering us and inspiring and carrying us forward. And you and I both have that for this material. Uh, oh, so what I was going to say was uh, agreeing with what you said, sometimes in modern life and very often in the ancient world, the big dreams instructed people in what they had to do specifically to heal their bodies. So spirit can come through psychically, teach us and guide us to what our bodies need for their healing. I've had that experience. Some of my travelers have had, uh, and it's heavily, very, very well recorded from the ancient Greek world. I mean, people got direct prescriptions in dreams for how to feel, heal a physical ailment. But as you earlier said, the ancients recognized that the ailment uh, began in the soul and it was being expressed through the body. I think that's the one big problem we have today that, that people don't understand that, um, that, they, that whatever befalls them its source comes from within. It's your body trying to tell you something. And if you if you pay attention to it, I, I, I love the fact that there used to be temples for dreaming. There used to be oracles. There used to be, you know, that, that aspect of reality, of, of the spiritual essence was so integrated into the physical reality back then that that it was magical and it's such a shame that it is not done today on on a larger scale than it is because quite often at least with with even with my own life i i have you know every every now and then something has happened or or i experience something and i say okay so what is what is this telling me is this this isn't just ow <laughs> it's why is it ow and and mm-hmm. you know you 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 work on it and you dream on it and I'm, because I do meditation and because I do all that kind of stuff I have I think an easier veil to go through to get to that level than most people do but but dreams will will give you indications through synchronicities and all sorts of things if you just pay attention. Oh, absolutely! Dreams are a wonderful, complete language in themselves. But they've become a forgotten language because, as we're both saying, not enough people pay attention. Um, Our way of life is get up really quickly uh, and you're too tired and you're stressed from everything, from work and politics and bills and the breakdown of the world. And get up and get your coffee and get going. Don't think about life too much. And don't stop and take your time and think about what happened during the night. This is in drastic contrast to many, many other societies throughout time uh, who did consider dreams very important. Some traditional cultures, uh, the first thing they did was the 
tribe would gather together around the campfire and talk about the dreams they had last night. And people mm-hmm. would share their dreams and talk about what, what dream did you have and who was it for and how was that for somebody else or for the tribe or for our community. And traditional cultures also always enacted the important dreams. They didn't just tell the story. But if somebody dreamed a ritual, the community would perform the ritual. They would literally embody the dream as a community and bring its power fully into um, our lived reality. So that dreams are incredibly important. And we it's our mistake that we are living in a, a time and place that is so pressured and, and rushed and concentrating on the physical and the empirical that we mm-hmm. have uh, reje- uh, rejected and denigrated the critical importance of the invisible and how well it and how often it communicates to us if we listen. Oh, absolutely. And I had a client with, that came to me and, and was going through something. And, and when I dug in with them and, and I said, okay, so this is something that you have control over and this is something you can work on and this is something you can help to open this and allow a freer flow of energy and and they looked at me and said you mean I have to work on it and I said yeah it's your problem so you should work on healing it and she said no I just want a pill and you know the mm-hmm. and 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 it it, it blew my mind because mm-hmm. and I said I said to her the pill is going to just take away a little bit of the difficulty you're you're going through but you know if you don't actually heal this area we've found then it was it'll manifest in a different place in a different way but it's going to be the same issue and you know nope she just wanted a pill and she went and got her pills mm-hmm. so uh, yeah. um so so it it it's i think it's it's there's a need to change the the way everybody views the body and the soul and and how it is so important to us. I mean, it, it gives us the results. It gives us the answers if we if we only take the time to look and listen to them. And sometimes a pill helps. Sometimes, I mean, I needed to have a hip replacement. Now, um, actually, I, I, I looking back, I think maybe I needed to be held in place for a while to do a little bit of looking into my life and the direction I was going and stuff like that. And so um, the universe arranged for me to break my hip. So I was, you know, flat on my back for a while, but um, I listen a lot more now because I don't want to break any more bones, but you know, it's, it's important for people to understand that, that they do have the talent and the skills and the abilities to, to dig in and to find answers. And quite often you need a facilitator to help you do that. Um, and one of the other things that you, you do and you explained in your book, which, which I think is, is so amazing, is, is, is psychodrama and, and how you facilitate people working through difficulties that way. You want to talk a little bit about that because that's not something most people know about. Uh, sure, I will, but um, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and comment on uh, your story of the, the client who did not want to work yeah. and turned away. Um, so this also brings us back to the sacred origins of medicine and psychology that we have fortunately, significantly abandoned and betrayed in our modern practices. All right, so Hippocrates you know, famous as being the father of scientific medicine. Uh-huh. Uh, he was actually the son and the grandson of Asclepian priests. You were trying to pronounce the name of the yes. god of healing, Asclepius. Yeah, I think get close. Used to it. Greek is, you did, yes. And Greek <laughs> is difficult. Um, but, okay. So uh, Hippocrates, who was the first scientific physician, was raised in the Asclepian dream healing tradition by his father and his grandfather and great grandfathers going all the way back. So medicine also used to be passed on um, from from parent to child as a, a, a sacred lineage within the family. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Hippocrates, he learned spirituality. 
and he was born into and trained into the healing tradition where scientific and spiritual practices were beautifully unified. And we have not had that for the last 2,500 years because with that turn to science, uh, we began to lose this the unity. Hippocrates said, so we're back to 2,400 years ago, all illnesses begin in the soul and end up in the body. All illnesses begin in the soul and end up in the body. So our body is manifesting through its symptoms what our souls are trying to tell us and we don't know how to listen to. He, Hippocrates also said, um, sorry, oh, regarding um, your client's comment of I only want a pill, yeah. I want to do the work, he said, for anybody who wants to heal, they have to first give up what is making them ill and then do the hard work uh, that will appear afterwards. Yeah. We have to do that for our healing. Hippocrates also said, leave your, you leave your drugs in the chemist's pot and make food and exercise and good life practices your medicine. Don't rely on artificial medicines, but what you do and what you eat and how you live is going to be your medicine. So all of these are beautiful directions for what brings about healing, and we've lost, we've lost them all. Back in ancient Greek times, the transference began from earlier on for about 1,500 years, the patient was the center of the healing process. And the, the, the psychologists and psychiatrists, oh, those words come from the, the ancient uh, Asclepian tradition too, by the way. Psyche means soul. Therapist means servant. So a psychotherapist is literally not uh, not somebody who repairs your uh, your neurotic functions, but a servant of the soul, psychotherapy, a soul servant. Mm -hmm. Psychiatry, literally, also from that tradition. Yatros means doctor. A psychiatrist was not a medication dispenser as they become today. Literally, psychiatros, soul doctor. Psychology is the, uh, the study and restoration of the logos, the order and meaning of the soul. So all of these idea, modern ideas that we're using were originally spiritual in unity with Soma and practiced as a holistic practice that was ultimately bringing about soul transformation, not just body healing. And as you rightly said, when we suppress the symptoms, well, we feel better and we can go back to work. We can have a nice weekend, but we haven't changed. And we're dependent on the medication to, er, to reduce the troubling symptom. And so people, of course, by the millions and millions, stay on, many, on billions of meds all their lives and never heal. When, in fact, we can heal so much, though, that we don't need the meds anymore because we've gotten down to the core of what's uh, afflicting us, and we've healed that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so soul healing through deep dream work and the use of sacred theater and seeking oracles and looking for visions all happened profoundly in the ancient world and for thousands of years, and we can experience those and restore them today. Now, regarding um, the use of sacred theater, well, theater also was originally a sacred ritual and a healing ritual. The, uh, the, in ancient Greece, theater was under the god Dionysus. Uh -huh. And uh, the tragedies were written and performed every year, every spring, um, as uh, rituals for the, re the resurrection of Dionysus, the reawakening of the earth. And most of the tragedies, well, the, main, all, the famous tragic playwrights we all know about, Gilles, Sophocles, Euripides, they were all combat veterans. In fact, everybody in the ancient world were combat veterans. Service was universal, and people served from, you know, from early adulthood all the way till they were 60. And wow. theater, yeah, 
So everybody was like, it was like everybody was in the National Guard and called up when needed until you were 60 years old. Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides invented tragedy, and many of their tra- most of their tragedies were about our uh, war and other psychologically, emotionally tormenting conditions that we experience. And they were performed in front of audiences of thousands. And they were, those were very equal in the ancient world. Though women and slaves were oppressed, not in the theater and not in the healing sanctuaries, those were all universal and available to everybody, and everybody was welcome. And people didn't just sit quietly and watch the performance and then clap. They cried, they screamed, they threw tomatoes. It was an intense <laughs> cathartic experience. In fact, our word catharsis also comes from the ancient tradition. Aristotle invented the word to explain the healing that we experience when we go to theater or when we do these rituals. Catharsis means the, uh, the release, the purgation of our negative emotions. In Aristotle's terms, especially pity and fear that's locked us up in us. And when we have our dreams or when we go to theater and see our lives performed before us, because what we're seeing on stage are our stories, and we identify with those characters, then we can achieve in a really intense catharsis and leave the theater differently than when we went in. And that has also happened to me in Greece. I've been to theater in Greece, one theater performance that changed my life. And oh my. that's very, very connected to this con- tradition. You know, I, you know, when you're talking about how the crowd took place, uh, took part in, in, in the drama, I'm, I'm seeing today and, and you, you, you may agree or not, but when I'm looking at the riots that are happening and flow into it, the energy of, of people and individuals when, when I see them interviewed and stuff like that, I'm finding that they really aren't rebelling against that cause. They're letting out the frustration that has built up inside of themselves, and they're using it as an excuse to act out and to be loud and to be violent because it's almost like they're berserkers, to be honest with you. Um, they, they, they are triggered by something inside of themselves as opposed to the cause they are protesting. And I found that unusual, and I've I've seen it in in riots that I that I've seen on television that I've been able to flow into, and it does feel to me as though society as a whole today is acting out their frustrations of what what life has become for them, and so they take part in these crowds where they don't even know what they're protesting, but they're able to scream and they're able to shout and they're able to you know, burn cars and do all sorts of stuff like that. Is there a correlation? Oh, absolutely. Um, I fully agree with your understanding and interpretation. Uh, and if this is true in both individual life and collective life. What the surface, uh, the surface event is only the trigger. It's not the real soul stuff that's going on underneath. But the surface event somehow is related to how we're feeling in our hearts and souls and triggers uh, the eruption of all related feelings um, that seem to be connected to that event, but it's not the same. It's not the same at all. So really, everything is both itself and a symbol and metaphor for something else at the same time. And people don't know that and they don't differentiate. And I thoroughly agree with you, not just in our country, but all over the world. People right, that's... are so, yeah, we're, we are in apocalypse and people are terrified and profoundly insecure and not able to think rationally, but rather the surface event triggers this explosion of their rage and their terror that's underneath for all of us and people who are relatively unconscious or just participating in their cultural norm without deep reflection and introspection and work on themselves uh, are very vulnerable. And then what we call the human shadow 
everything that's in the unconscious and people are unaware of most of the time comes rushing out in an explosion. And when it happens in large groups or in entire societies, we are in deep danger. And we're, so, we're seeing that all of them. So, you know, taking taking that from from what we're seeing, how do people, how can people reflecting on that, knowing that stuff is building up inside of them, what is a good way for them to 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 touch into whatever it is inside of themselves that they're they're rebelling against or or getting rid of that anger no matter what where its source is and and bringing a, a, be, a better sense of peace and tranquility into their lives what kind of um you know i i i scream creativity all over the place you know get into your creativity that will give you peace that will give you joy help it help it to sort of balance out your give you a, a better sense of um of being in balance um how how what can we what what can we say to people who are feeling this and not knowing what to do about it i guess is a better way to put it sure um well the first thing we should say to each other and to everybody is you're not alone we're all feeling this way mm. we're all frightened we're all insecure none of us know how this is going to unfold um this is like, you know, this is like the biblical flood that is taking over the whole world, and we're each trying to build our little arcs to try to uh, <laughs> determine how to survive this. Yeah. So, and that's actually, that's a good image for everybody. Realize that we are in collective danger, and we're all struggling to find our way to survive. And then ask yourself, each person, what do you need, on, who and what do you need on your arc? For survival during these hard times so that's one matter um, it, it's much bigger uh, all right way back um, many people might remember the famous uh, story of uh, Alexis de Tocqueville coming to the United States from France uh, shortly after the Revolutionary War and he wrote a very famous book called Democracy in America so this was when the United States was only about 20 years old, and he traveled mm-hmm. all over, and he interviewed hundreds of people, and he gave the most cogent insights about democracy and how it works and whether it can or will work here. What he concluded way back then, like around 1800, was uh, America's in real trouble unless it learns to be introspective. The United States is fantastic at being uh, externally motivated. It builds things. It wins wars. It conquers the continent. It attacks other people. It cuts down forests. But they don't think about who they are and what's going on inside them. And they're not good to their neighbors. And they're not checking out what's in their hearts. And they're not helping each other out. And they're not cleaning up their own acts. So Americans need to learn to think about and explore and examine themselves and take responsibility for their inner lives. That was said about us over 200 years ago, and it is so, so true. We all need to be working on ourselves and encouraging others to work on themselves, and we need to be doing it in community. And, uh, you know, yeah, okay. Um, Well, you know this, our listening public may not know, but I work extensively with military and veterans. Um, Mm -hmm. My work is probably best well known for that. And there's uh, much in my book, Soul Medicine, about working with warriors uh, in this way. Uh, They're really angry and hurt and frustrated people. And I can't tell, I want to tell everyone how wonderful it is to sit in circles with warriors who were berserkers and instead talk and share and listen to their stories and give them the time and the space to tell their stories and to have feel all their whole, their feelings about it. You couldn't, you're, 
you were in Afghanistan and you lost your your friend and you're in terrible firefights and you couldn't feel then, well, you can now and we'll help you and support you feeling it now and achieving that catharsis and inner purification and finding dreams and visions for carrying your life forward in a positive way. So there's actually so much we can do if we become community again and we restore spiritual practices and we value the inner life rather than tell people, forget your inner life and keep moving and get a job and don't worry and don't think about your problems and Mm. take more pills. None of that works. (laughs) But turning inward to ourselves and turning toward each other with really open hearts and open minds and creating communal activities for sharing, that really works. And that discharges uh, the explosions that have been built up inside us. Well, way back in in almost prehistoric times, um, in in I think it's either Scotland or England, there there was a community that if somebody um, did something wrong that hurt the community, they would put them in the center of the of a circle and they would stand in circle around them and everybody would tell them how important they were to them and how what they had done had hurt them and they they kept they kept the person in the center of the circle until they they were awash with love from the community and understanding that they had done something that was inappropriate and how it had impacted everyone and it changed their life. And it, it took the whole community to do it. But, you know, there were no there were no rules or laws. But when someone hurt another person, that's how they dealt with it. And it was a magnificent way to deal with it. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Bravo for that story. Thank you. And I hope all of our listeners really take it in. I have a very simple, straightforward, three-word definition for healing and what we need for healing. And you actually just summarized it. My definition for the healing protocol is spirituality in community. Mm -hmm. Your example is an example of that. Keep the person in the community and make sure that they know they're a valued member, even though something went wrong. Another example similar is uh, Polynesian tribes used to do something very similar. When a member of their community was depressed, well, they would throw a big, they would build a dais in the center of the village. And they would take the depressed, depressed person, depressed, pushed down. No. We're elevating you, and you sit on the dais. You're our honored guest, and the whole community is uplifting you and telling you how important you are to us to literally, we will together lift you out of your depression. We're not giving you antidepressants. We are your medicine. The community is your medicine. So that's another example. And yet a third one is, I love this one as well, uh, in uh, Eskimo communities, when two members of the community are having a feud, wanting to hurt each other, cursing each other, cheating each other, same thing. They're brought into the center of the community circle because this is affecting the whole community. And the entire Mm -hmm. community makes a circle around them, and the two antagonists are put in the middle, and they take turns. No physical violence allowed, but one at a time, Yell and scream and curse and say everything you want to to your antagonist until you're done and it's out of your system. Then your turn to be quiet and the other person goes and says everything you want to and gets it out. And they go back and forth and back and forth with everybody witnessing it. So there's no secrets. Nothing's done behind anybody's back. And they keep doing it until they're, they're empty of the emotion. And by the end, they're laughing and hugging each other. And the community is put together and and there's nothing dirty. And listen, I do the same thing with our warriors. I take our Vietnam uh, War veterans back to Vietnam. And I facilitate groups between our veterans and their veterans where the same thing happens. They tell each other their stories. Oh, I was Mm -hmm. a pilot and you were an anti-aircraft gunner. Oh, I was so scared of you when you were shooting at me in the sky. 
and you almost got me, and this is how I felt, and back and forth and back and forth, and they both tell the stories, and really, pretty soon, they're laughing, they're supporting each other, they're telling the other one what a good warrior they were and how much they honored each other, and by the end of our meeting, they hug, and instead of being former foes, these are the words of the Vietnamese to Americans. From now on and forevermore, brothers and sisters who survive the same hell. We don't have different uh, stories. We are, we are the lips and tongue of the same mouth telling the world the same story. Oh, wow. So, yeah, really, wow. We can end conflict this way between, in our country, between antagonistic groups, people on the right, people on the left, if we get them in the same room talking to each other. Mm -hmm. and sharing the real things behind their attitudes um, between, um, you know, alienated ethnic groups. Uh, I'm working by Zoom with Russian war healers and uh, and with Ukrainian and trying to get them to talk to each other this way, too. Oh, wow. It's possible. Yeah. Well, I, I have, a, I have a, a, a story that's a little bit like that. My mother was um, ill. I was her caregiver for the last 30 years of her life. And at one point she she was very depressed and the doctors wanted to give her antidepressants. And I said, I, I really don't think so. I, let me try something. And I got three kittens. And there is no way anybody can be around three kittens and not laugh. And before you knew it, she had laughed enough so that she wasn't depressed anymore. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... so. But yeah. I, I, not a, not as dramatic, but but I think it's it's paying attention to and, and knowing the person. Certainly, if people don't like animals, that's a bad way to do it. But um, but it's 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 using using what you know about the person and and helping them to work through it. And I think that now this works with the P, with PTSD, obviously. Um, but you know your your journeys are fabulous, and the stories about the warriors were, were just incredible. What what mm-hmm. what happens though with people that can't do this kind of journey? I mean, how 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 do you work with them when when it's just not physically possible to to take them to another country and and have them go through all of the battlefields? I mean, it it was. I mean, your stories are just amazing. Um, but not not everybody can you know can do that unfortunately. But you have to be able to to not tone it down, but take it to another venue so that so that people mm-hmm. are able to experience the same thing. How do you do that? Yes, uh, there's there's a, a lot of ways to do it, and a lot of ways that I do it. So thank you for that. Uh, one matter is that I I am a psycho. <laughs> Excuse me. I am a psychotherapist, and I see people, you know, in weekly or biweekly or whatever schedule it is, but we do the work slowly over time, but using a lot of the same principles. So, for example, okay, use the phrase dream incubation, because that's what the ancient Greeks called it when you went into a healing center or sanctuary and stayed there for a long time. They were really incubating dreams and preparing your psyche for the vision and dream questing through fasting and prayer and isolation. Okay. Mm-hmm. One is we can do that ourselves. So when I'm working with somebody individually, I guide them in how to set up and incubate themselves at home in their own bedroom. So just this past weekend, I've been working with a man who is uh, – sexual abuse survivor, but he couldn't, he knew it happened and he has symptoms and blocks, but he didn't know his story. He didn't know where it happened. This past weekend, he decided I'm going to do an entire week-long incubation. I'm staying in my apartment and fasting. I'm praying. I'm journaling. I'm doing artwork. I'm not eating and I'm just really meditating on what happened to me, what happened to me, what is my story, what piece of my story am I missing? And I'm so happy to tell you that that was last weekend, and we met today, 
and he found a dream told him, a dream revealed to him the piece of his abuse story that for decades he hasn't been able to access. You know, and this man, he doesn't have uh, much uh, financial resources, so I'm seeing him at a cut rate, and he couldn't possibly afford to go overseas with me. But we can do these practices on our own with a facilitator or support or in community. Mm-hmm. So you know, I also run retreats stateside where we do like a, a weekend-long intensive um, dream incubation retreat over a weekend. Um, wow. So it's, it's, it's accessible, it's inexpensive, uh, and we're doing the same practices that the ancients did only, you know, in modern guys. And it works. So, sometimes, too, it's spontaneous because I can remember I, I said to my mother once, um, you know, usually I get messages by the, by the, the people that come to me for readings um, because they seem to cluster and they they all have impact on my life in one way or another so that I'm learning from. I, I often have said I, I have learned so much from the people I have read. I should have been paying them. And at one time I said to her, you know, I've had seven people come to me in a row, all of whom were sexually abused as children. And I can't relate to that. And the night after I spoke with her about it, you know, I, I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to pull from this. And the night after that, I remembered I was sexually abused as a child and saw it and knew exactly what it was. And then in the morning I said mm-hmm. to my mother, I figured it out. They woke up a part of me that I hadn't been ready to deal with up mm-hmm. to this uh, 30, 30, 40 years later. And it was so cool. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me and said, oh, no, that couldn't have happened. I said, oh, trust me, it happened. <laughs> and yeah. But it, it, it was a real dream. It was a big dream. And mm-hmm. It was, yes, it was, that's what, yes, it, it, it was, it was amazing. And, and, you know, so, you know, that was a spontaneous one, but probably waiting until the time that I was ready to be able to deal with it and understand it and move on. But, and that's important too, your readiness. Uh, was it, um, I think, was it in, in Hamlet that, uh, at Hamlet's death, Shakespeare it's had the simple words, ripeness is all. Yeah. We need to be ripe. Yes. So we need to be ripe and ready and receptive. And that's that's so. Um, I could share a, a spontaneous dream healing that I had as well in this tradition. Um, we can further uh, demonstrate to our friends listening tonight how this works. Uh-huh. Uh, and I can point about um, soul medicine. All right. So, uh, my biggest physical challenges have been in my digestive system. And uh, and there are childhood reasons for that I won't go into right now. But uh, way back in my 20s, I was diagnosed with ir- irritable bowel syndrome. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I was teaching a course on Asclepius and the, the beginnings of medicine in ancient Greece. And we were talking about some of the cures that were recorded in ancient texts. I had a doctor in the class. This was adult education. I had a doctor who said, no, no, those are nice stories, but those are real myths. They didn't really happen. They just wanted people to believe in the healing God and believe in those powers. Uh Okay. Well, all right. So. I believe they happened. We have thousands of these testimonies from the ancient world. This modern medical, a scientific physician didn't believe it. I went home thinking, what can I say? Well, how can we demonstrate that this, could, this is real and it's really possible? Okay. That night, that night I had a dream. In the dream, I saw, well, this doctor was an older man who had gray curly hair and a beard, which is also mm-hmm. how Asclepius, the healing god, is pictured. So in my dream, he walked in, I was asleep in my bed in the dream, and Asclepius walks in, 
and it look Asclepius also looks like this physician. So the doctor and the guy of healing both walk into my room in my dream and they come up stand by the side of my bed and say to, and Asclepius says to me, uh, you've been calling me. You want help for with your gut? And I said, Oh yes, thank you. And I've been <laughs> asking for help for a long time. Thank you for yeah. hearing. Yeah. And he said, uh, What uh, divine one? What can I do to heal my gut? And he said, Well, irritable bowel syndrome. You know what? Your problem. This is all in the dream. The problem is not your bowels, like the doctors tell you. The problem is irritability. The core of irritable bowel syndrome is the irritability that's in your system. There's nothing wrong with your guts. You have to clean out the irritability. Oh, okay. So the adjective is the, the, is the illness, and the noun is just the symptom. Got it. That, uh, my thinking. So what do I do? And the, in my dream, the guy said, I want you to take an enema of lemon juice and vinegar oh. and use acid to burn the acidic feelings that are still in your digestive system. And then he left. Okay. 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 I never heard of anything like this, but this is not modern scientific medicine. This is poetic medicine. I called yeah. that doctor who had been in my class, I told him, you and the healing God came to me last night and gave me this prescription, just like happened in ancient times. Uh, have you ever heard any of a, a healing like this for IBS? No, never heard anything like, of it. Well, do you think I should do it? I asked him, and he said, oh, now you and I are in a deep scientific experiment. You have to do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Of course I was going to. He said, I have only one suggestion. Um, dilute the lemon juice so you don't burn yourself dangerously yeah. when you take the enema. Okay? So the next night, I set up uh, my candles. I burned incense. I cleansed the place first. I could prepare the enema. I have a statue of Asclepius that I brought back from Greece. I set up an altar in the bathroom. And I took the enema. And I I have chills even remember, not chills, I don't know what. My body, I feel tingles going up and down my spine now. This is decades afterwards, remembering how I felt. I felt so cleansed and liberated. And I understood, oh, I was prescribed acid by a divine source to burn off the excess acid, emotional <laughs> acid that it has accumulated in my system. So it's homeopathic, you know. The, yeah. I'm using, I'm using uh, the same healing medicine, giving myself the same kind of treatment to get rid of it and to burn it off. I felt so joyous and so happy, like I had burned off decades of irritation and frustration from my being. And my digestion wasn't completely healed by that, but it was very, very significantly healed. And it's been much better ever since. And ever since, um, when it gets um, uh, unhappy, a little wonky, uh, I'll, I'll do the treatment again. I'll do another enema and give myself that cleansing. Wow. I so, <clears throat> spontaneous dream called forth by another doctor who was an unbeliever at the time and we're working together on the tradition. And by the way, he came to Greece with me. After that, he came to Greece with me three times and he studied holistic medicine and he had been a radiologist and he became a holistic physician. It changed his life so much. Okay. And so we see, we see that we mistake what the real affliction is, as you said earlier. It was my irritation at life that was causing my digestive difficulties. Not anything wrong with my digestive system. And if I could cleanse the irritation, my body, my the, that's the, the spiritual level, then my soma will heal itself. And it did. I have a similar story. In oh, share my, yours. 
in my early 30s, I was diagnosed with ulcerative colitis. Mm -hmm. And um, they did all their tests and everything, and they said, okay, you have ulcerative colitis, and it's severe, and you should get your, your life in order because it is going to take you out. And I looked at the doctor, and I said, I do not have time to die. I have too much to do. And he said, did you hear what I said? I said, I, I heard what you said. Did you hear what I said? I said, this means mm-hmm. I have to change my life. It doesn't mean I'm going to die. It means I have to change my life. And I turned my life around. Um, come And it went away. And, oh, just, you know, 40 years later, I, I did mm-hmm. the... Um, the uh, barium enema thing because everybody's supposed to have it. And, you know, so I did. And I, and I did tell the doctor, I said, I had ulcerative colitis when I was much younger. He said, you never had ulcerative colitis. There's no sign of anything like that here. He said, well, I Uh changed my life and healed myself. And he said, no, you didn't. You never had it. It was a misdiagnosis. I said, oh, trust me. I know what I had. (laughs) There there was no mistaking it. (laughs) Uh-huh. I think that's and, and rather than accepting you and your evidence, the doctor, bless him, was so um, ensconced in our modern medical model that he said it's impossible. When yeah. in fact it is possible and you're proof, and he wasn't able to open himself up to that much of a vision of transformation. But yeah, let's build no. on this for a moment, and uh, this is so important, and your story is beautiful. Thank you for sharing it. Every illness, every illness is a possible initiation and transformation. Uh It's death, a death rebirth process that we're in. It's not that you're dying. It's something is dying or changing, and it's changing form and looking for uh, recreation, rebirth. Uh, In traditional cultures, people go through an illness, they're always considered to have died and been reborn. And many cultures even give people new names when they recover from a serious illness, like they had been on a vision quest and they've come back as a different person. Mm-hmm. So that's what you and I did when we, he, uh, when we self-healed our illnesses. We actually, um, the old self died and a new self with a new body-mind uh, order to our inner being um, was recreated and we were restored oh, in yeah. a healthy balanced way. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, and I, and that's when I was then that's when I full time went into, you know, I, I still taught school and stuff, but I I turned my life spiritually around for sure. So, uh, <clears throat> I notice we're out of time. You are going to come back again, and we're going to talk more about this when your new book comes out as well. But do you want to give out, you know, your, your websites and stuff and, and let people know where they can get a hold of you? Sure. Thank you very much for that invitation. First of all, thank you for this uh, this talk and uh, our discussion. It's very deep, very rich and inspiring. And I hope many of our friends out there will follow up um, explorations. So uh, for me, well, this book is called Soul Medicine, as you said, um, it came out, what, where are we? It came out um, about six months ago, I think. <laughs> We're getting old. I can't keep track. Uh, oh, yeah. Anyway, it's available at um, bookstores, Amazon, from the publisher, Inner Traditions. Uh, so my website is just my name, Edward Tick, so www.edwardtick.com. My email address is dredtick at gmail. That's just D-R-E-D-T-I-C-K at gmail. Um, my phone number is 518-727-8090. Okay. And I, I look forward to getting into more of this with you. I wanted to get some more into the archetypes, but we'll do that next time. And um, thank you so much for, for sharing your your book and your wisdom and, and your philosophy with, with me. It's It's nice to talk to somebody that talks the same language. Although I don't talk Greek, but, you know, the spiritual part. (laughs) 
So we're talking the the uh, Ur language beneath all of the different languages. We're <laughs> yes. talking the real soul stuff that's at the base of all language. So thank you. It's wonderful to speak with you, and I agree. When we meet fellow travelers uh, on similar paths, uh, it's just golden. It's a gift from the divine as well. We need it each other. It truly is. And a lot of synchronicity yeah. in there, too. So I thank you again, and thank you for sharing so much with um, my audience. And it, it's a wonderful audience, and they are seekers of in their own rights in, in many different modalities and ways. So I'm sure that, that uh, there's going to be great interest in, in what you've had to share and certainly in your book. So thank you so much great. for sharing your time with me. Okay, you're very welcome, and I thank you as well, and we'll meet again down the road. Absolutely. Take care now, and thank you, everybody, for sharing your time with us. We look forward to having um, to having you check everything out and hopefully check out this book because it was an amazing, amazing book. And look for me uh, next Monday night, another, another super author and, and more great information to add to your your pile of spiritual wisdoms insights and inspirations hopefully you find something useful here and if you do share it please good night now